I wrote this little book. It's almost just a pamphlet. It's 20 pages long. I did it for uh, my grandkids mainly. I'm an old engineer, so naturally I t try to promote my grandkids to be in engineers or in that field. And I don't want to push them too hard. So I, I wrote them an earlier book, Engineering Stuff, and that's for young kids. Then as they got older, I want to make sure that they um, knew what an engineer had to do. So I, I call this, So You Want to Be an Engineer. And it uh, basically <clears throat> shows what an engineer has or has to know or should know well, if they're going to be an engineer, it's 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 just basics, and uh, there are a lot of kids that uh, take engineering because it sounds good, and uh, and they are smart, so they pass all the grades, <clears throat> all the tests, all the courses. They get their engineering degree, and they're so far from an engineer. And at Chrysler, we got a few of those. They were sharp as a tack and came in and. They just weren't engineers. They didn't want to be an engineer. They passed the test, but uh, but they had to go off and do something else. And I didn't want to push any grandkid into doing something they didn't want to do. So I thought I'd expose them to what what an engineer should know. And as far as what school to go to, I uh, I preach that it's a, a success of an engineer is a function of the student, not the college. Uh, at Chrysler, we had many, many uh, bright engineers, successful engineers who went to small, small schools. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. The engineering courses are just fine. The interest is there. Uh, you get your degree. And that's the, the other thing. Um, when a company hires an engineer, uh, it's not that they want an electrical engineer or a petroleum engineer or a mechanical or civil. Uh, whatever engineering degree you have is fine. They'll take you and train you to be the kind of engineer they want. I graduated mechanical and a petroleum company wanted me. Uh, Westinghouse also. Uh, and and Chrysler. And uh it, and we even had an agricultural engineer at the Chrysler Institute of Engineering where uh, I went, and it's a, it's a two-year program. You graduate from school, you hire on with Chrysler, you have various assignments throughout engineering, three-month assignments, I think it was. And uh, then you take courses uh, for two years, and you end up with a master's degree in automotive engineering. And then you go permanent in some a department that has an opening and they turn you into the kind of engineer you want. Same way with the petroleum industry. They'll take any kind of engineer as as long as they can teach them how do you get oil out of the ground and how do you drill for it and how do you uh, manage the system. So uh, whatever kind of engineering you take um, is not going to get you on a path if mechanical engineer is not going to necessarily be a mechanical engineer. And today with computers, I think everybody's going to be a computer engineer of some sort. Uh, I was uh, back in the days before computers. In fact, as I show a slide rule on here, uh, and that was our calculator. All the engineering students had those things dangling around, hanging on their belt. And you'd go take a test, and that was your calculator. And then after we graduated, we uh, had those uh, with us. Everybody had one. If you wanted to make any calculations at all, and engineers do that. Uh, so we all had uh, slide rules. And it was a big deal when uh, calculators came into being. And then far later, for me anyway, when computers came in. Today, uh, computers can do th so many things so much faster. So I'm sure I'm out of date uh, engineering wise. But uh, in the case of uh, CAD, computer aided design, uh, when I was at Chrysler, we would design the, the uh, various parts and, uh, and then we'd have the parts made and then we put them together and they didn't fit so good. And that's for various reasons. 
But uh, with computer-aided design, everything's designed in the computer. And if I'm designing a fender shield and somebody wants to attach something to that shield and asks for holes to be put in a certain place, uh, with CAD, everything fits. And that's why your, your fits on cars today is, is so good. Everything fits because it's all done to, to a single database in the computer. Now, uh, I'll mention AI, artificial intelligence. So I've been preaching this and kind of my voice gets lost in the wind. But uh, I say that you could have an engineering course done in AI and a kid on a farm someplace, 100 miles from anywhere, could take that course, become an engineer, get a degree, and go off into the industry. He doesn't have to go to brick and mor a brick-and-mortar school. The arguments against that is, oh, it's valuable to go to a school. Yeah, that's fine if you're not milking the cows and working the farm. But if you're sharp, you're working the farm, you can have a computer, have the Internet, and get your degree. And I think we should we should do that. I guess they are doing it some places, even in uh, Afghanistan, I understand now. Now, let's, uh, let's talk fasteners just, just for a moment. It's very basic stuff. Uh, a fastener can be a screw, a nail, a weld, or adhesive, anything that attaches two things together. And the basic thing about a fastener is it should be in shear, not tension. So if I have a beam here, and I want to attach a bracket to it and hang a big weight on it. If I came in here with a with a bracket and put a screw in here, that screw is in tension. And you can tell it's not going to hold very much. You can put a bolt through it, and that's in tension too. That's stronger. But far, by far, the stronger way of doing it is put that fastener in shear. You can either put it here, I'll put a screw or a nail or adhesive there, or walk it around to the top and put your nail or screw in here. And in order for that, to, that, that, that fastener is now in shear, so is this one, and it would have to walk all the way down around that, and that would be much stronger. Uh, a lot of uh, people miss that, and uh, just keep in mind, no matter what the fastener, rivets, adhesive, anything, has got to be in shear and not tension. Another subject is corrosion. Uh, a lot of people can put things together and make them work. But to make them work in the uh, 120 degree heat of the desert, in the sand, in the, on the salt flats with the corrosion, in the high humidity, in the minus 40 degrees of Winnipeg, uh, it, it's a completely different animal. Uh, and one is corrosion that you have to watch out for. And there's all kinds of corrosion. And you can't have a pocket someplace that's going to catch salt from the road spray and then uh, fail, fail your parts. Um, the auto industry has gone to galvanized st uh, steel on one side usually. And, uh, and uh, the corrosion... Uh, target now is 10 years without perforation. It's, it was that way years ago. Maybe it's different now. But uh, there's a lot, of, a lot more to engineering something besides just making it work. Um, the good example are the, the hot rods and the, the motorcycles. They're very pretty. And uh, it, it basically, they're, they're made to ooh and ah people and, and have the aesthetic value. Uh, they're not made to withstand uh, um, endurance testing, uh, severe weather changes, or um, corrosion, corrosive uh, atmosphere and things like that. So um, engineering something is a lot more than just getting it together to make everything clicks and, and everything works. I mentioned blowers. Uh, and the only reason I have this in here is because uh, a maintenance man was working on a, a, a air handling unit at, in a drafting room, and uh, 
and it wasn't blowing much air. And his comment to me was, maybe that motor's running backwards. <laughs> He's thinking, if that's the case, the air should be going the other way. And that, that is definitely not so. If you have a blower wheel, Well, there is coming out here, and in here you have a uh, a blower wheel with vanes on it, and it's spinning in this direction. And a side view of that would be something like that with the blower wheel in here and an inlet ring here. And as that wheel spins, it draws in air here, pressurizes the outer part, and that pushes it out this way. Now, the thing about that maintenance man was if that blower wheel was running backwards, spinning this way maybe, yes, that's not efficient, but it would still be drawing air in here and pressurizing this, and the airflow would still be the same direction. So, uh, along these lines, I uh, have been watching a TV show, uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, Gold Rush, and uh, and they had a problem with their system where their pump was uh, at a higher level than normal, and it was pumping way too much water. And I'm sure that's a centrifugal pump. And they said, "Oh, what are we going to do?" So they d did a bypass and just bled off a lot of the water from the discharge of the pump and uh, they did the wrong thing a centrifugal um, pump doesn't care if you pinch off the uh, discharge and the power doesn't go up it's not a positive displaced pump it's uh, it, the, the impeller will just spin a little easier and all they had to do is put a valve in and pinch it off and get the right amount of water but uh, but they didn't, and I haven't heard any repercussions. Of course, I don't know how I would find those repercussions from that TV show. Now, I cover sound and vibration here, just, just because I was exposed to it, and, and uh, vibration is a, is a major subject, and, and so is sound. Uh, all engineers won't get into sound business, but they will get into vibrations. Uh, and if we take a speaker, any kind of speaker, big woofer or small speaker, uh, look upon a speaker as being an air pump. It's pumping air. Boom, boom, boom. If it's low frequency, it's pumping it slow. If it's high frequency, it's pumping it fast. You can't get the cone to move that fast in a big speaker. So if you want high frequency notes, you go to a very small speaker, a tweeter, and it can vibrate faster. And then maybe you combine things. But uh, keep in mind that a, air, a speaker is an air pump. There's a thing called the Doppler effect. And it uh, you experience this when you, a plane flies overhead. It goes at a frequency, changes as it gets near you, and goes away. Or a race car. As soon as it passes you, the frequency goes down. And the reason for that is <clears throat> you're here and your sound source is here traveling this direction. It's making noise that's coming out going to you. And as it, uh, as it uh, is, is traveling toward you, it sounds about the same because this angle is pretty small. If you're standing right next to a, a railroad track, for all practical purposes, that train is coming right toward you. Except that when it gets near you, it's six feet away. And, uh, and then at that point, it's going away from you. So while it's coming to you, that frequency, since the source is traveling and the, the sound waves are getting bunched together, the, the frequency is going up. And as soon as it gets by you, you hear the true sound of the airplane or, or race car. And that's, that's the low point you, you hear. And then as soon as it goes away, the frequency starts uh, 
the source is sending sound waves back to you, but you're stretching them out. And that's why when a race car goes by, it goes wow and off into the distance. So that's the Doppler effect. And uh, I guess you ought to just ought to know that. And on vibration, everything has a natural frequency. Um, if um, any, any part in the room has a natural frequency, it wants to swing, it wants to vibrate at that natural frequency. Your body has a natural frequency, it probably has many. But uh, take the pendulum of a clock, uh, a, pe a weight hanging on a string or a rod, and it swings. That has a natural frequency. The way you change that is you can make the uh, system stiffer and, and uh, increase the natural frequency, or you, can make it, or you can make it less rigid, and that will increase the natural frequency. So if we have a clock and with a pendulum swinging on it, if you shorten the distance from the pendulum to the pivot, you're making that system stiffer so it swings uh, faster. If you lengthen that string and you've increased the natural frequency and it swings slower. And that's how you adjust clocks. And you can, you can adjust that. A good example is a steering wheel shake on a car. You don't want the car uh, the steering wheel buzzing in your hands when you get up to some high speed. So what the engineers do, they they have two things they can do. They can take weight out of the uh, steering system, and that'll and that'll raise the natural frequency, lower lower mass, uh, will give you a higher frequency. And the aim is to get that frequency up above the driving range, so it won't bother you. The other thing the engineers can do, they can stiffen the steering wheel. And that's what the industry does. They stiffen the column, attach it very tightly to the lower uh, instrument panel reinforcement, and take as much weight out as they can. Now, we added the airbag, and that uh, lowered the natural frequency, and that was in the wrong direction. But you make that thing so stiff that it won't shake until you're going, you know, some speed that that the car can't go. So you've chased it out of the operating range. And in the book, I have a chapter on electricity. And the only thing I want to convey is the fact that power is the product of voltage times a current. You multiply those together, 110 volts and so many amps, that gives you power. And you can have a lot of high power with very high voltage and just a little uh, current, or you can have it with low voltage and a lot of current, the same power. And uh, what will hurt you is extremely high voltage and extremely high current. Transformer is an interesting thing. You have a power uh, plant uh, making electricity, and now you have a product of high voltage and current. And you want to transport that across the neighborhood to the houses. And if you transported it uh, with high current, that current would heat up the wire and the wire would have to be hot because you, the wire would have to be large and that current going through there would want to heat it up and you'd have a lot of losses. So what the industry does, they take this power that they have and up the voltage to 20,000 volts or who knows what but something extremely high, and then they can transmit that power uh, across a very thin wire because the current is so low. Then when it gets to your house or a neighborhood, it goes to a transformer, and that converts that power into 110 volts or 220 and a higher amperage. And that's how power is transported. I mentioned a little bit of fluids in the in the book. And the thing to remember about fluids is that at high velocities, fluids act as a solid. Now, next time you're in a swimming pool, take your hand and slap the top of the water. That's high velocity, and you're trying to move that water, and the water feels like a board. So that water, that fluid, is acting as a solid, 
at the high velocity. If you would film a uh, uh, outboard motor going through the water, it's not moving the water hardly at all. It's unwinding in the water because at high velocities, fluids don't like to move. Now, I, I, I mention rubber because a lot of young engineers don't realize that rubber is not compressible. It is less compressible than water. Now, I'm not talking about sponge rubber. I'm talking about dense rubber, the rubber that uh, you use in engine mounts. And uh, rubber does not compress, but it can dis be displaced. And I'll demonstrate that. If I have a biscuit of rubber and I put a load on it, this will go down and the sides will bulge out a little bit. So what I've done is I've displaced the rubber into a different shape. But now I, I will have some cushioning there. Uh, if by chance, and I've seen engineers do this, they have a container of some sort and they put a rubber biscuit in it. and then put the load on it here and expect it to, to uh, cushion the load. It will not. That rubber will not compress. You have to relieve the edges or whatnot to uh, let it deform. And then you'll get some, in, in the case of uh, engine mounts, in the case of uh, any mount really, and put the engine up here and So we have a rubber in here molded and, <clears throat> and you notice that rubber is in shear and that's how you want to suppress uh, vibrations. As, uh, if you're going to try to isolate something from a vibration, vibrational standpoint, you want the rubber in shear. So that's how all your engine mounts are. Anything that mounts anything, the rubber is placed in shear and it, it will deform like that as you pull this side down pull this side up so it works that way as far as rivets are concerned the rivet is here and you mash this and deform it into um, a shape like that. And that holds the two pieces of uh, steel together. Now, since I've compressed that and it's a coal headed rivet, there's no tension in the rivet. Now, when they build bit bridges, they uh, place the um, rivets in a furnace or an oven and they get red hot and they've expanded. And then they toss them up to the to the worker on, on up into the, into the bridge works, and he drops the rivets in and and head and heads it. And now that rivet, when it cools, it gets smaller and it squeezes everything into tension. That's how your bridges are built, and that's the classic use of rivets. It's a hot rivet. Coal rivets are used, and that's where they don't need the uh, tension. And uh, the only reason I mention this is uh, I ran into a uh, young metallurgy, metallurgist, and he was trying to tell me that coal rivets had tension. And I said, uh, so we had a, um, an assembly there, and I said, you mean to tell me if I take a hacksaw and cut that head off, it's going to fly apart? And he says, yes. And I had a mechanic just cut the thing off, and it just laid there, so... Uh, this young man was a bit off base. I have two things to mention on metallurgy. <clears throat> uh, when fasteners fail in the field, that's that's a big deal. Uh, if you have a connecting rod bolt that all of a sudden decides to break, or any other uh, fastener that's under tension. Uh, quite often the problem is hydrogen embrittlement. When they make the bolts, there's a spec that says 
that bolt is to go through an oven, I think at 400 degrees for an hour to drive any hydrogen out of the metal um, because later that hydrogen can cause embrittlement and the bolt will break. And this is years, years later or months later. And um, so uh, what, what, <clears throat> what the suppliers would do is they'd take a whole skid box full of bolts and put them in an oven at 400 degrees for an hour. But the bolts in the center, they never saw anything like 400 degrees for an hour. And so we had to watch their uh, process closely to make sure we didn't have hydrogen embrittlement because suddenly you've got a bunch of engines out there that the bolts are popping. And uh, the other thing is uh, zinc embrittlement. Now, this isn't widely known, but we had a control arm, a suspension control arm, and it was made out of uh, galvanized steel for corrosion purposes. And we had a strut that welded to it. And we welded it, and then we put it on test, did the fatigue testing and whatnot, and it kept breaking. The strut kept breaking off. It turns out that the galvanized coating, zinc coating, would get into the boundary layers of the metal uh, on the heat of the welding and cause it to be brittle. And this is very cruel. So what we did, we, <clears throat> we made the uh, part out of uh, uncoated steel and, and put the strut on it and then hot dipped the entire assembly into a zinc, co a zinc bath. Later, we went back to the galvanized uh, metal and then we bolted the part on and that was fine. I have a section on design and, uh, and I point out that uh, no matter what you design uh, on paper or sketch, keep in mind that things are not rigid bodies. They do deflect under load and don't get yourself fooled with designing parts that are supposed to fit and suddenly you put a load on them and they don't fit. So you've got to keep that in mind. Um, the other thing we did uh, in body sealing, we had a deck opening and we had eight joints that formed that opening that had to be weld and had to be sealed. And then when the rain came down, it wouldn't, we didn't want the trunk to get wet on the inside. So what we did, we went back to the designers, had them change the, the design of the opening such that we only had four uh, places to seal. And that increased our probability of getting a good seal and making sure we had a dry trunk. There's a, a great uh, process called FMEA, Failure Mode and Effects Analysis. And the FMEA is used uh, probably in all designs now. This is where you dream up all the uh, different ways something can fail and then assess the uh, probable results of those failures and then go back into the design and design those uh, causes out. And I mentioned on design, uh, design for durability and reliability. You want it to work all the time and you want it to work for a long time. And you want it to withstand the corrosive uh, environments, the 120 degree temperatures, the uh, minus 40 degree temperatures, the uh, various impact loads, that the part might see and uh, there's a lot to designing and you got to dig into it and cover every base. You can design things to reduce the catastrophic effect of it like an engine mount. If an engine mount fails, do you have something designed in that catches the engine and keeps it from falling up to the roadway? In the case of the fuel system throttle, uh, you have a return spring on that. If that return spring breaks, you should have a second one there to operate. And that's not, that's required by the government now, a redundant throttle return spring. I suggest to the kids to don't be afraid of inventing something. All you have to do is come up with an idea, and I assure you, you can come up with an idea that nobody else has come up with. It happens all the time. It happens every day. Uh, the problem people have is you have to recognize your bad ideas from your good ones. And if you have a bad idea, bite the bullet, 
pull a string on it and, and get on to something else. But don't be afraid to invent something. Believe me, uh, you can do it and you will do it. As far as what to take in school, um, besides all of the engineering um, subjects that, that you take, you do have a chance for some electives. And I would suggest uh, sound and vibration, some um, business law, hydraulics, optics, astronomy, and but more important, management of people courses. Because if you're going to be a good engineer, you're probably going to be the boss of a few engineers, and maybe a lot of engineers. And you're going to have to know how to deal with people. And so um, people programs, people courses, management of people is very important. And so be sure to take some uh, courses along those lines. We had uh, people at uh, Engineers at Chrysler. We kept promoting them. They do a great job. We can promote them. Then you promote them to the point where they have to manage people and they would fall flat. They were a great engineer, but a lousy manager. And uh, that's the reason you have to take some people programs on the way through. And you can make a good living as a contributing engineer, but you can get more things done if you're the boss of many engineers. So set your sights high and get something big done. Good luck.